Hello and good evening to you. Coming up on BBC London. Bus drivers in the capital take to the streets, calling on Transport for London for better working conditions. Fatigue. Drivers working odd hours, getting tired. Seven, eight, nine days in a row is a lot. Meanwhile, news that the upcoming tube strikes have been called off also tonight. On the trail of his stolen bike, how an East Londoner led police to catch the thief and he got his bike back. Plus, the remarkable story of how a woman was reunited with her father after 30 years, thanks to this programme. And here at Wimbledon Park, we're getting ready for the explosive fun of fireworks night. But with more cancellations across the capital this year, is it becoming a rarer tradition to remember, remember the 5th of November. A very warm welcome to the programme. Good to have you with us. First tonight, working nine or ten days in a row, no toilets, no heating in the winter, and fatigue, just some of the reasons why bus drivers in the capital have taken to the streets today, calling on Transport for London to improve their working conditions. Campaigners say safety should be a priority. Here's our transport correspondent, Tom Edwards. Bus drivers marching this morning, calling for better conditions. A bus driver's life sometimes isn't easy, and many say fatigue is one of the problems. What are you protesting for? For a start, toilet, fatigue, drivers working odd hours, getting tired, seven, eight, nine days in a row, it's a lot. Working hours too long and the facility is not there. Really? Yeah. How hard is it being a bus driver? Quite hard, actually. Yeah. yeah. There are many issues that we want to change. Um, like toilets, it's not easy for us to travel and do our trips and not have the toilet at the other end and have to go back to the other end. And uh, we need decent breaks. Safety is not DFL's priority and never has been. Campaigners have been calling for safer buses for years. Since 2014, 80 people have been killed in collisions with buses. I had to give up, it was just too stressful. And then you go home and you're tired because it is tired driving. It is tired mentally being aware of what's going on around you. Your passengers are your priority. You have to make sure that they're safe. If you've got to break and someone's not ha holding on, they are going to fall over and hurt themselves. Who gets blamed? We do. The families of those who have died in bus collisions, like Kathleen Finnegan, who died at Victoria bus station, recently also said they thought changes needed to be made. We want to see how they investigate these incidents and we want to see if the bus contracts are having an indirect impact on safety. The drivers are under a lot of pressure. Um, I would be concerned about the working hours of drivers. Campaigners say contracts need to emphasise safety. It needs to be a turning point because the new government, bless them, are going to roll out more bus services across the country. OK, good. More, better bus services. The problem is, if they use what they call the London model, it will have the same institutional safety problems as we've got here in London. So you have contracts that reward miles and speed. That leads to bad driver working conditions, which is what today is about, and that leads to bad safety outcomes. Killed, seriously injured, families being torn apart. TfL says drivers' safety is very important and it takes their welfare seriously. It says it is working on a range of measures to improve working conditions, health and well-being. Drivers, though, want action now. Well, let's turn to the tube now. And Tom, our transport correspondent is with me because in the last uh, hour or so, the tube strikes have been called off. Yeah, the tube strike on Thursday was going to be significant because there was going to be no tube because the uh, train drivers were going to be out on strike. There was also a tube strike planned for the following Tuesday. In the last hour or so, ASLEF have announced that they have received a significantly improved offer. I quote, you remember the RMT did exactly the same uh, last 
last week. So the strikes are off, suspended. That's good news at the moment uh, for commuters. The union won't discuss what this significantly improved offer is, but there's no new money on the table, I'm told. Uh, so I'm assuming there's been some kind of movement around the four day week uh, for drivers. So it's suspended at the moment. This offer will be put to the union reps on Thursday. So we'll have to see uh, what happens after that. OK, so just to clarify, this Thursday and next Tuesday's tube strike is off, but we need to kind of keep an eye on Watch it. Watch this space. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Our transport correspondent, Tom Edwards there. Thanks very much for being with us this Tuesday evening. Plenty more to come, including the heartwarming story of a woman reunited with her father after 30 years, thanks to this very programme. And... Stay tuned, London, because I'm going to be sprinkling a little Christmas razzle-dazzle on you here from La Clique in beautiful Leicester Square. There are renewed calls on the government to improve laws around surgical procedures. It's after at least 18 women say they were left injured and disfigured following treatment at a clinic in Battersea. We obtained footage of a beautician at Luxury Medical Aesthetics and Academy performing liposuction and showed it to a plastic surgeon who described it as a disaster waiting to happen. It's not illegal in the UK for a non-medic to perform surgery as long as they're not claiming to be a surgeon and have consent from the client. I should say, Matt Graveling's report does contain graphic surgical images right from the start. She don't have no visible job. Yeah? This was advertised as a fat reduction masterclass in southwest London. And a corner, and as well, nothing on the middle. Luxury Medical Aesthetics and Academy near Battersea promised to teach a new method of lipolysis, normally injections where chemicals break up fat cells. What was actually used was a scalpel to make a cut before a long cannula was inserted to suck out fat. This is definitely not lipolysis, this is liposuction. Dalvi Humza is a consultant plastic surgeon and member of the Joint Council for Cosmetic Practitioners. This poor lady is at a high risk of, of uh, infection at the very least, if not septicemia and potentially having major complications after this procedure. This procedure was carried out by Daria Vishneska, who, along with her sister Monica, own luxury medical aesthetics. Filming is Sarah Guy, a beautician who paid £1,500 to attend this one-day class. Immediately, I knew that this place was unsterile, unsanitary and not fit for treatment for anyone. Blood on the chair that had not been wiped down, blood and dirty floor, blood splatter up the walls. We're talking dirty sinks. There was gauze swabs lying around that had still got blood on from the previous person that had been in there and nothing had been cleaned. Ashton Collins is director of Save Face, a voluntary register of accredited aesthetic practitioners and supporting 18 women who have complained of complications and injury after fat reduction treatment at luxury medical aesthetics. It's important to say, isn't it, that it's not illegal what has been done here. Yeah, shockingly, it isn't illegal. You know, there, there is no um, legal framework to dictate that these treatments should only be carried out by GMC medical plastic surgeons, um, which, you know, it's outrageous that we would even need a law. But actually, we are in a state now where we need that. And that's why we're calling on the government to introduce a piece of legislation that actually prohibits anyone other than GMC registered plastic surgeons from carrying out these incredibly dangerous procedures. In the UK, we have a ridiculous situation where you can actually take a scalpel and cut somebody open and do a procedure as long as you tell them that you're not a surgeon and the other person agrees. A Department of Health and Social Care spokesperson said, We are extremely concerned by reports of highly invasive cosmetic procedures being performed by inadequately trained practitioners. We would urge anyone considering cosmetic surgery to find a reputable, insured and qualified surgeon. We are exploring options around regulation of the cosmetic sector and will provide an update in due course. The BBC contacted the owners of Luxury Medical Aesthetics but they did not respond to the allegations. Wandsworth Council is investigating complaints about treatments in the borough but wouldn't say which places specifically. Matt Graveling, BBC London. 
And you can hear the full investigation on tonight's File on 4 on Radio 4. That's at 8 o'clock this evening. It's also available now on BBC Sounds. Next, it may have happened to you or someone you know because around 20,000 bikes are stolen in London every year with little chance of getting it back. Well, one Londoner who found his stolen bike up for sale online managed to come up with a plan to get it back. Yasmin Rufo picks up the story. When Alistair's bike was stolen from his flat last week, he thought he would never see it again. But that evening, something on Gumtree caught his eye, a listing that looked suspiciously familiar. I was in shock, really, in terms of when the bike was listed, given the close proximity from the theft to the actual listing of, of it on Gumtree. Just knew that I had to act quickly to get it back or else it would be flipped and, and kind of disappear. Alistair reported the ad to the police and concocted a plan to get his bike back. So I contacted a friend who's based up in Manchester and we kind of devised a plan where he would message the thief first, asking for the address. I had arranged a time with the thief to, to meet him at the address given, which was 11 o'clock, and thankfully the police rang me in the morning to inform me that officers would be assisting me at the scene. Uh, we managed to recover the bike. The police warned you not to go to the address to try and retrieve your bike. Why did you decide to do it anyway? I was very much of the mindset I would go with or without the police. I know that's maybe a little bit stupid, but given the kind of sentimental value the bike has to me, the amount of money and time I'd, I've, I've put into it so far, I was very, very determined to, to get the bike back one way or the other. He has now been arrested and will appear in court next month. Do you feel that justice has been served? I feel like justice has been served given Firstly, I've got the bike back, but also there's a criminal record um, already established against him. Although Alistair was fortunate enough to retrieve his bike, many Londoners aren't so lucky. And one campaign group has been demanding safer and more secure cycle storage units across the capital. We launched This Is Awkward to talk about the really awkward places people have to keep their bikes at home. You know, cramped corridors in their bedrooms and how it's kind of not fair, really. There's not enough space and secure places on the street for people to keep their bikes. If there's more and more of these solutions on the street, more and more people are using these secure hangers, it'll become more obvious to thieves that it's a lot more difficult and a stronger deterrent for them to actually steal the bikes in the first place. The responsibility is absolutely on the local authorities, the government, the mayor, to make sure the money is there to deliver the solutions we need. The mayor has pledged 40,000 new cycle storage units and for Alistair, Oliver and many other cyclists this will be very welcomed news. Yasmin Rufo, BBC London. Now a roundup of some of the day's other news stories. 123 Metropolitan Police officers have been barred from working in policing over the last year. That's more than twice as many as in 2020 and 2021. Scotland Yard says it continues to make significant progress to relentlessly identify and root out officers who corrupt the force's integrity. The father of 10-year-old Sarah Sharif has denied physically abusing and killing her as he began to give evidence in his defence at the Old Bailey. Her body was discovered at the family home in Woking in August last year. Urfan Sharif and Sarah's stepmother and uncle all deny murder. And Network Rail says plans to redevelop Liverpool Street Station are being redrawn by a new project team. It follows thousands of public objections, including from Westminster Council and Historic England. The original planning application remains under consideration by the City of London. Now to the remarkable story of how a woman came to be reunited with her father after 30 years, thanks in part to this very programme. Mika had been told that her father slept rough in Tottenham, but while she was watching BBC London one evening, she saw the story of a Londoner who goes around helping homeless people in the area and decided to contact him to see if he'd ever come across her dad. She told our reporter Jessica Yeur, it feels like a miracle. This is the moment that a father and daughter were reunited after 30 years. I knelt down, I gave the biggest cuddle, I just sat with him. It felt very surreal, it was very emotional, but it felt very homely and warm all at the same time. And this is the man that made it happen. How was your journey, man? Yeah, it was good, thank you. Mika had been wanting to find her father, but had no way of locating him. All that she knew is he had been sleeping rough in Tottenham. And then she saw this. Tonight, check this out. A 34-year-old from Tottenham helping the homeless across the capital with a little help from a cycling group he started. 
My name's Veryl Paul Walcott. I'm from Tottenham and I started the Homeless Network. On all the TV they were showing all the stuff does the homeless out with the bikes and stuff and I thought, well, it's got to be worth a try. He might ignore me, but I'll give it a go. So I messaged him and then 20 minutes later he replied back saying, yeah, I found, I've, I've located your dad. So when Mika had contacted me, I was so um, taken back by the news that she, she had basically found her father through connecting with me that I actually went down and visited him. I had a discussion with him and I said, I've got something I want to say to you and I'm not sure how you're going to take it. And he's like, OK. I said, well, there's someone called Mika that would like to see you. And he looked up at me from looking at the ground. He looked up at me and his eyes filled up and he goes, how do you know my daughter? Yeah, I want to see her. Tell her I want to see her. And he gave me a little voice message to play back to, to send back into um, to his daughter in Wiltshire so she could hear her dad's voice for the first time after 30 years. Veryl kept in touch with Mika and Omar until she was ready to come to London to meet them. Went over and hugged them and yeah, it was a really surreal moment, but it didn't feel like a stranger, if you know what I mean. It did feel like home in a very weird way. Mika now comes to London often to visit her father. He doesn't have a phone, but he's never missing for long because Veryl keeps in touch. For me, it definitely feels like a miracle. If you ask Farrell, he'll say, no, I could do this. This can happen all the time. And I think that's kind of the mentality we've got to have is actually it doesn't have to be a miracle or one-off thing. This we can reunite people. And after filming, just by chance, we see a familiar face. Jessica Yore, BBC London. I told you what an incredible story and thanks to Farrell and his team for the work that they do. And staying with Make a Difference, to someone's life, meet the man who set up a charity to provide free football sessions for children across South London. And it's grown from a few sessions a week to almost 20. Kieran Connolly has been telling us why it matters. Let the ball do the work, too many touches. Start again, start again. My name's Kieran Connolly, I'm the founder of Sports Fun For All. And this is our down and football session, which is one of 17 of our free weekly football sessions across South East London. So the reason I do this, one of the main reasons would be to offer young people somewhere to go and socialise with their friends for free, build their confidence, learn to win and lose, build their resilience and develop life skills that will hopefully hold them in good stead for the rest of their life. Hi, my name's Louis and I love this session because it can help me develop my skills and like it helps me like get new friends and like just like have fun. Yeah, it's just fun to be honest. How difficult is it to get funding? I'd say very difficult. Just this month alone in October, I've already submitted eight to nine funding applications. My name is Moshi. Uh, I started coming here from when I was eight years old. We just play football. The thing that we love the most and it's just amazing. Where's your Where's your target, man? One of the young people that's come through the program that I met back in 2021 is Elias. Two, one. He's quite introverted, quite timid, but he's worked on himself, um, developed his personality and become a coach and learnt the leadership skills to now lead this project at Downham. Coming here in 2015 as an immigrant and uh, not being able to speak English, it was very difficult for me to um, get more confident. I was very shy, um, didn't have a lot of friends. Go on, Mosh, go on, Mosh. Now I'm studying sports management at the University of Westminster. Play on, play on. Young people need a safe space to go to, and that's what Sports Fun for All provide. Kieran Connolly there. Now, remember, remember the 5th of November. Yes, it's bonfire night. And although plenty of people were marking it at displays at the weekend, this was uh, Battersea uh, at the weekend, uh, many are also out this evening, including our reporter Chris Slegg, who is at a ticketed event in Wimbledon. Wrapped up warm, thankfully, Chris, are you? Yeah, Riz, we believe this is the biggest surviving display in London to actually take place on the 5th of November. 20,000 people are going to be here tonight. Crystal Palace used to be bigger. That always used to take place on the 5th with 5,000. That hasn't come back after COVID. And there's been a trend in recent years of cancellations. This year, Carl Shorten, Black Heath are among those, and Victoria Park too, uh, that haven't survived. Councils citing rising costs 
and the environmental impact. But this is a tradition thousands still want to enjoy. And I've been asking people here tonight what makes it special to them. Before we hear from them, first of all, the deputy leader of Merton Council on why they believe it's still important to run their displays. Its popularity is shown by the fact that it's sold out. It's so popular with both local residents here in Merton, close to Wimbledon Park. We also had the events in Wimbledon Park on Saturday. But also we get visitors from other boroughs as well because it's a lovely family-friendly event. Does it get harder to justify the decision each year, though, to go ahead, given the pressures on council money? So we're just so proud of Merton. We want people to feel proud living here. And there's events like this that really do bring our community together. You know, I remember coming to this when I was a kid. And I hope the kids here today are making memories. So we think it's important to carry on putting on these events. It's not just the fireworks. It's the fireworks, the atmosphere, the rides, the lights. But the music that goes with it amazingly, it creates a whole atmosphere and experience. What do you love about it? I love it because, like, every year it's so much fun. And there's rides and the fireworks are very nice. And I I love coming here because it's it's nearly it's so close to my birthday. <laughs> I think it's good to get the community together. All the kids love it. They were talking about it all day at school, getting ready to come. A lot of the families are ready to come. Um, I think it's a lovely night. I think it brings everyone together. Yeah, you can feel what it still means to a lot of people, but your sense it is only going to become more difficult in the coming years for councils to put on these sort of displays for all sorts of reasons. Only today, a petition signed by a million people delivered to Downing Street calling for greater restrictions because of the impacts on animals and vulnerable people, although many argue that done the right way, uh, those impacts can be lessened or even eradicated. And certainly everyone here uh, tonight, Riz, is just concentrating on having some good old-fashioned uh, fireworks fun. Absolutely. I hope they do enjoy it. Thanks very much, Chris. And of course, happy birthday to someone there who was celebrating tonight. Thank you, Chris. OK, how energetic or flexible are you feeling? I ask because wait until you see this. La Clique is an artistic show, a blend of cabaret, circus, comedy and burlesque all rolled into one that has toured the world for 20 years. And to mark that milestone, it's returned to the West End this evening. Alice Bandukravi brings us a special preview. From the sublime to the breathtaking, La Clique is back in Leicester Square, celebrating the 20th anniversary of wowing and charming grown-up audiences with its intimate cabaret. And make no mistake, these performers are some of the best acrobats and aerialists in the business. It's got such a variety of amazing acts and the skill level, the talent is always just super, super high. Um, and it just has this kind of, um, I mean, the Spiegel tent is just always amazing because it has this kind of inbuilt magic, I think, that when you walk in, you're just in a different world. Danique describes this as easy. You're from a family of performers, Yes, though. yeah, yeah. So my mom, my dad, and my sisters are all performers. Everyone is, the whole family. Yeah. It's in the blood. Yes, like showbiz baby. Yeah. <laughs> and this is showbiz, baby. This is showbiz, baby. <laughs> it all happens in a Spiegel tent, a travelling cabaret room, which is assembled like flat pack furniture for the duration of its tenancy before moving to the next city. The small round stage makes it an especially up close and personal experience. One of the key things, like a lot of circuses, is that the audience is not only watching the artist, but they're watching the audience watching the artist. So you're looking across the small little stage and you're really part of the environment and you're as close to the show, you can feel the nervousness, you can feel the sweat, you can feel, the, you can feel what the audience, feel, what the artists feel in the, in the context of a, uh, of a show that's so intimate, yeah. So intimacy is all about, it's what it's all about. <laughs> It's also very Christmassy, set within a Christmas market that opens tomorrow. It is the most fun you can have at a Christmas market. I love Christmas so much. We're in a big Christmas market. You come to this big wooden tent. This variety show is extraordinary. You can go and have mulled wine or whatever you people drink. I don't know how it works out there. But basically, we're going to be running from the... Uh, well, we're running from tomorrow until January. And this is Christmas. We are the Christmas show. Alice Bandukravi, BBC London. 
well, guess who's got to follow that? Uh, only Sarah Thornton, who's got to check on the weather for us. Well, it is a Hello. hard act to follow, isn't it, really? <laughs> Especially it's so grey and dull at the moment, isn't it? That's the story of this week. A lot of dry weather, it's really pleasant, but it is actually going to be fairly cloudy, I think, as we go through the next few days. And certainly it was today, wasn't it? Uh, temperatures today were about average for the time of year. 10 or 11 degrees is what we'd expect at this point in November for our daytime high. As we go through the week, it's going to be milder than that, but certainly not today. And you can see those leaves are starting to fall away there isn't much wind around though which is good news if you're just about to head out for the evening and look at some fireworks well it's going to stay dry and it is fairly mild overnight but it is because of all of that cloud around as well here's the story then on the bigger picture we've got high pressure out towards the east of the uk it means we're nice and settled there are very few lines there of course they denote that we've got very light winds and that's not mixing the air up very much so it means we don't have much in the way of those breaks of the cloud having said that there could be one or two appearing here and there especially out towards the east of the capital as we go through this evening and that would allow for some mist and fog to form by tomorrow morning. I think any way you slice it we will have a pretty great start tomorrow. Temperatures though uh, pretty mild for the time of year to start a November morning 9 or 10 degrees and then through the day tomorrow still sticking with that blanket of cloud the odd break here and there. It is a dry day though and actually the temperatures are starting to lift up a little bit so as I say today we're 10 or 11 degrees quite typically tomorrow 13 or 14 Celsius. We're starting to bring in some some much, much milder air. And that process is going to continue over the next few days as well. As we go through tomorrow night, overnight into Thursday, very, very similar. Ken, could be a bit of mist and fog first thing on Thursday morning. And then the day itself is going to be dry and mild. The wind just picking up just a little bit here and there out towards the south and east. That could, as you can see, break up the cloud just a little bit more, but it is a dry day. Temperatures at 15 degrees. Again, that's four or so degrees above average for the time of year. Here's the air mass chart. We look at it quite a bit, don't we? Not so much at this time of year but we are because we keep the oranges right the way through until the weekend and again that suggests to us that we do have some very mild and some settled air with us over the next few days so look at these temperatures uh, a lot of mist a lot of cloud on this but it is a dry outlook right the way throughout yes it will be difficult in the mornings especially tomorrow morning where we've had those breaks tonight there could be some fog which is very slow to clear eventually lifts up into low cloud signs of brightness as we go through the second half of the weekend into the start of next week as we go through next week, it's still dry, it's still settled. It looks like we are going to see more in the way of sunshine, but with that, it will be a little bit cooler as well. I love the fact you said signs of brightness. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> thanks ever so much. And that is where I leave you this Tuesday evening. Thanks very much for watching. A reminder, uh, if you missed it, that the planned tube strikes for this Thursday and next Tuesday have been suspended. Uh, lots more, of course, online, including the warning to shoppers looking for a good deal on a luxury advent calendar to watch out for online scams. That's on the BBC News website and the BBC News app. Uh, from me and everyone on the team, do have a lovely evening and uh, enjoy the fireworks if you're going to a display. And of course, keep an eye on the pets. For now, bye-bye.